Thank you very much, uh, Julie and Mr. Chairman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to see so many of you uh, this morning. I hope you are enjoying the meeting. I first of all want to thank the organizer for uh, inviting me to uh, speak uh, at this conference. So it's never a good time to talk about this issue of nausea and vomiting. And uh, hopefully we do it far away from lunchtime, so hopefully you'll be, too, you'll be okay. And I won't be too stimulating. Um, this is my disclosure that I've received fundings from a number of sources to help with my uh, uh, clinical uh, research. Now this morning I'm going to talk about a number of areas uh, in uh, the management of post-operative nausea and vomiting. First of all, we're going to look at from a patient perspective, what do our patients think about having nausea and vomiting after surgery? And then we will talk about some of the risk factors because I think by knowing the risk factors, perhaps we have a better chance to prevent nausea and vomiting in our patients. And then I'll show you some of the anti-emetic choices. What are the uh, newer drugs? What are the good combinations? As we talked about multimodal technique yesterday for pain management, the principle applies where multimodal combination anti-emetics works better than single agent. And then to, uh, lastly, just review with you some of the findings from the consensus uh, panel uh, and uh, published about uh, in 2007. So the question is that, is it still a problem? Well, if it depends on who you talk to, some would say that, you know, I don't see nausea and vomiting in my patients. Anyone in the audience that don't see nausea and vomiting in your patients? I don't see any hands up there. But uh, a few years ago, when I remember talking to a fairly large group of audience. At the end of my talk, a gentleman stood up at the end and said, you know, I don't know why you spend hour talking about nausea and vomiting because it doesn't happen to my patient. I wasn't sure whether he doesn't visit his patient post-operatively or he could be a pathologist just wandering into the wrong room. But I can tell you it certainly happens and it happens uh, frequently more than what we like to see. So just share with you uh, this fairly recent data that look at across the board, across the board in the US. And as you can imagine, nowadays we use a number of prophylactic antiemetics, either by itself or even two or even three. But nevertheless, you can see incidence of vomiting range between about 10 to 30 percent. Incidence of nausea is even higher, from about 30 to 50 percent. And about a third of these patients said that nausea and vomiting interfered with their recovery from surgery. So clearly, it still happens commonly. And uh, especially nausea is a much more difficult nut to crack. Who cares about post-operative nausea and vomiting? Do we care? Do our patients care? Well, if you talk to patients, they certainly hate to be sick after surgery, and the reason is not surprising. They can't move around. They are stuck in bed. They can't eat. They can't drink. They got to have an IV strap into onto their arm, and on top of that, not thinking about the emotional, psychological aspect of nausea and vomiting after surgery. And in fact, many patients will say that, you know, I don't mind having some pain, but I just don't want to be sick. Now, many of, uh, some of them will say that, well, you know, nausea and vomiting is not a big deal. Suck it up, it goes away after a couple of days which is probably true most of the time, but occasionally, and this case in point, this lady developed persistent retching following her eye surgery, and she lost her vision. You can see this eyefema at the back of the anterior chamber of the eye. Not quite a small complication. Another patient here who had a procedure, so it's meant to enhance how her eyes look, blepharoplasty. Clearly, this is not a desired outcome. And the patient had to have reoperation, prolongation of hospital stay, following persistent retching. So clearly, not common, but potentially could be disastrous with persistent retching. In the US, as you may have heard, that the healthcare system is changing rapidly. And increasingly, 
our reimbursement partly is going to be based on patient satisfaction. And there's increasing evidence that this is going to come in the next few years. And in fact, from next year onwards, almost 30% of our reimbursement will be based on patient satisfaction, on pain, nausea and vomiting, the discomfort that they may experience after surgery. So we have really every incentive to try to improve our pain management, avoid patients having complications, nausea and vomiting, ileus, post-operatively, in order really to meet this new mandate from our new healthcare system. Now, post-operative nausea and vomiting is a big topic. And if you were to care to go to MetLines and you put down post-op nausea and vomiting, you probably come up with about three to 4,000 articles. And clearly, it's very difficult to shift through these articles to come up with some sort of evidence-based guidelines. So a few years ago, a group of us who were interested in this area essentially spent over a year, went through the literature, and assessed all the papers that have been published on nausea and vomiting, and came up with these consensus guidelines that were sponsored by Society of Ambulatory Anesthesia. And in fact, we are going through another update at the moment. So of all these people that you and I manage and care for every day, can we predict who are the ones who are more likely to develop post-operative nausea and vomiting? And the answer is yes, there are some risk factors that we can identify, both from the patients as well as what we use in our anesthetic, that can potentially predispose this patient to post-operative nausea and vomiting. So let's take a look at some of these risk factors. Patient-specific risk factors, being female, there is a three times, in general, the risk for developing post-operative nausea and vomiting. Interestingly, non-smoker has somewhat an increased risk. Not that I would advise my patients to smoke before surgery, but interestingly, you have to be a chronic smoker. Telling your patient, having surgery next week, go and have a few puffs of cigarette, unfortunately, is not going to do it. History of post-operative nausea and vomiting. Very predictive. Someone who comes to you and said, every single time when I have surgery, I throw up. Those are the sort of patients, if you don't do anything about it, guess what? You're going to see that patient throwing up again following your anesthetic or surgery, as well as a history of motion sickness. Anesthetic. We know that inhalation anesthetic predisposes patients to increased risk of post-operative nausea and vomiting. Perhaps the older one, maybe higher incidence such as ether, halothane, higher than the newer ones such as desfero and isoflurane, but nevertheless, they are still hematogenic. Nitrous oxide is an interesting one. It does increase the risk, not by much, probably about 10 to 15% based on recent data. Now we do know that opioids is very hematogenic. And I'm sure you are familiar with patients that did well until when they get their first dose of oxycodone, morphine, fentanyl, and then they throw up. So opioid, highly hematogenic. Certain surgical procedures, and some of it may be not intuitive, such as surface procedures like breast procedures, laparoscopy, they are associated with a high incidence of nausea and vomiting, and the longer the duration of surgery, probably related to the fact that they have more general anesthetic in terms of inhalation agent, they also have a higher risk. So as you can see, there are many risk factors. And over the years, there have been a number of investigators came together and put a, a sort of short list of some of these risk factors. And this group from, uh, originally from Germany came to, uh, up with this four short list of being female, history of PONV or motion sickness, use of opioids and non-smoker, and you can see that the more risk factors you have, your risk for developing nausea and vomiting is incremental up to about 80% if you have all four risk factors. So let's next take a look at where does nausea and vomiting originate? How can we prevent it? Where do the drugs work? This is a representation of the brain, and you can see that there are a number of inputs. Now, one important input is from the gut. The gastrointestinal tract has a very rich source of serotonin, and it contributes 
enormously to the genesis of nausea and vomiting, along with the supratentorial, as well as the uh, vestibular system. They all come to this area called the chemoreceptor trigger zone, which is an area on the floor, fourth ventricle, very porous to chemicals, moving in and out. And it is this area where most of the receptors mediating nausea and vomiting resides. So let's just focus on this area, the chemoreceptor trigger zone. And you can see here there is a, a number of receptors. Many of them are familiar to you. Serotonin receptors, histamine, muscarinic, dopamine, and more recently another class of receptors called the NK1 receptors or neurokinin receptors. Most of the drugs that we use acts as antagonists on one or more than one of these receptors. And then the impulses will go to the vomiting center. And interestingly, you will see that the neurokinin receptors are also featured uh, prominently in the vomiting center. So the question is that, is there an ideal antiemetics with no side effects? And I would say that, yes, that is the silver bullet give it and you will be fine. Well, unfortunately, it's not quite simple, and drugs such as this one was thought to be the best drug since sliced bread when it came on the market and later found to have some side effects. So let's just take a look at some of the options available to us to prevent post-operative nausea and vomiting. I would say that today's practice, probably the largest use class is the serotonin antagonists. And the first drug that came on the market was on Dancitron, which is now generic across the world, followed by other 5-HT3, the Lacitron and Granicitron. And the most recent one that came on the market is called Palinocitron, uh, which is also indicated for post-operative nausea and vomiting. Now you'll find that in general, most of the 5-HT3 antagonists have a fairly short half-life. For example, on Dancitron, it's about four hours, the Lacitron, Ganesitron between about six to eight hours, with the exception of Palinocitron, which is, has a much longer half-life of about 30 to 40 hours. The question is whether the longer half-life translates to significant longer clinical efficacy. Again, it's not well answered. There are some emerging studies that suggest it may last a little bit longer, but not quite uh, eight to 10 times as long. So what is new in this area of PONV research? Now, I'm sure many of you have the experience of using on Dancitron. And you give on Dancitron to some patient, it works well. But others may not work as well. You can give doses on Dancitron, it doesn't seem to work. This study was conducted a few years ago where they gave a group of high-risk patients on Dancitron. And they also, at the same time, took a sample of blood to measure their enzymes that metabolizes on Dancitron, which is a cytochrome P450, one of the subspecies 2D6. And as you all know, we are genetically different, so we got different amount of 2D6. And interestingly, what they found was that those patients who were labeled as ultra-rapid metabolizers, in other words, they have a lot of 2D6. And when you give on Dancitron to this group of patients, it doesn't work very well. The incidence of vomiting is much higher compared to a group which has got very little of these enzymes, known as poor metabolizers, and on Dancitron works better because there aren't that much uh, enzymes to metabolize on Dancitron. So translate to clinical practice, if you see a patient where you give on Dancitron, it doesn't work well, perhaps it would be better to switch to a different drug with a different metabolic pathways. Now I'm not gonna talk to you about whipped cream uh, today, but certainly a drug that we use commonly um, called propofol uh, that was, uh, I think, really changed the practice of ambulatory anesthesia uh, in the 80s. Propofol, when it first came out, nobody thought that it has anti-emetic properties. I mean, it was a good drug. Patient woke up much quicker, more clear-headed, but they didn't, people didn't know that it has anti-emetic anti properties until several years later Increasing uh, studies show that when you give patient propofol, they also have a lower incidence of post-operative nausea and vomiting. Just to show you this data, uh, over 10 years ago, where they looked at comparing isoflurane uh, 
with total intravenous anesthesia with propofol, and both in inpatient at the top panel and outpatient at the bottom panel. And again, you can see a series of vein diagrams, but effectively, incidence of nausea and vomiting is much lower when you gave propofol as the maintenance anesthetic. And in a case of outpatient, the incidence is about half. So certainly, propofol as a maintenance agent is a significant, has a significant antiemetic effect. So let's talk a little bit about these neurokinin receptors. Well, when I said it was new, but it's not really quite new because it was discovered back in the 1930s. It's a G-protein coupled receptors, and you may be familiar with one of the ligands that act on this receptor, substance P. Now, substance P, as you know, is a uh, neurotransmitter for pain, and there are also two other um, chemicals that act on the receptors called neurokinin A and neurokinin B, which interestingly have effect on nausea and vomiting. So there have been a number of studies that looked at the uh, use of uh, neurokinin receptors. Now, where can you find neurokinin receptors? Well, if you do a, a PET scan, as this study has done, that if you stain all the neurokinin receptors yellow, and you'll find that neurokinin receptors are literally all over the central nervous system in the brain. And if you use a drug such as an NK1 receptor antagonist, and this drug is available on the market as an antiemetic called a prepitin, uh, you can comprehensively block the NK1 receptors. So certainly it's very effective in blocking all the NK1 receptors. And let's take a look at how this drug works in patient populations. Well, in a study that we conducted a number of years ago is a multi-center study where we looked at comparing a prepitin, which is the uh, first and only NK1 receptors available on the market, compared with a drug that you and I are very familiar with on Dancitron. If you look at the incidence of no vomiting, two doses of a prepitin, either 40 or 125, achieve about 90 to 95% incidence of no vomiting compared to about 75% with ondansetron. So certainly as a drug to prevent vomiting, uh, this is clearly a uh, fairly effective drug because you can say to your patient, if you were to receive these drugs, you have nine, at least nine out of 10 chance of not getting vomiting. What about nausea? Well, although statistically it was still better than ondansetron, if you look at the incidence of no nausea or significant nausea, but as you can see, there is still a substantial number of people uh, with nausea. So although we often talk about nausea and vomiting as being one entity, in fact, it is actually quite separate. And some drugs uh, seem to be more effective against vomiting. Others seem to be more effective against nausea. So in general, the 5-HT3 antagonists and the NK1 antagonists are more effective against vomiting and drugs such as uh, transdermal scopolamine, droperidol, seems to be more effective against nausea. What about patients who are on PCA opioids in the post-operative setting, which I'm sure you're familiar with these patients. What we found is that a very small dose of naloxone in the uh, opiate, competitive opiate antagonist, uh, seems to have an effect in reducing opiate-related side effects. So we tested two different doses, 0.25 mics per kilo per hour versus one mics per kilo per hour. Now you would think that, well, what does 0.25 mics per kilo per hour translate into? Well, very simply, if you take an ampere naloxone, which is uh, 400 micrograms or 0.4 milligrams, if you put in a liter of ringer's lactate or saline, infuse it over 24 hours, in a typical adult, it works out to be about quarter mics per kilo per hour. And again, you can see that this small dose, which does not antagonize analgesia, in fact, paradoxically, we found that this dose actually enhances analgesia, which is another story, um, does decrease the incidence of opiate-induced uh, nausea and vomiting. Now, there are a list of other effective antiemetics. I put up on the list here dexamethasone, which we talked about a little yesterday afternoon session. Certainly four milligrams has been shown in many studies, probably over 30 or 40 studies, to be effective against nausea and vomiting. Now, one of the concerns about dexamethasone 
is its potential side effects. And we know very little about these uh, uh, potential side effects. So there have been a number of cases of avascular necrosis of femur reported. But mind you, not from single doses are typically repeated dosage with high dosing, 16, 20 milligrams of dexamethasone. Delayed wound healing and immunosuppression, again, is theoretical. There hasn't been really cost-effect relationship established. Hyperglycemia is something that you would see transiently, even with the four to eight milligrams of uh, dexamethasone, typically lasts for a couple of hours, and then it comes down. What about some other drugs? Dimenhydrinate, histamine antagonist, certainly is effective. I would caution using a lower doses because sedation is a, could be a problem. Droperidol is another drug that has been used for many years. Uh, more recently, perhaps in the last 10, 15 years, because of the FDA black box warning against the use because of the potential QT prolongation, its use has somewhat diminished, but certainly is still available. Uh, Haloperidol, interestingly, in the same class of droperidol, seems to be coming back in fashion, not because it's a better drug, I would add, but because, simply because it has no specific black box uh, warning, which in fact now, many other drugs have black box warning, even 5-HT3 antagonists. And in fact, if you look, to look at studies comparing droperidol and andansetron, both of them can cause QT prolongation. Transdermal scopolamine is another formulation that is delivering scopolamine transdermally, and certainly there have been many studies. This is a recent meta-analysis show that it's effective as an anti emetics And uh, we did a study combining transdermal scopolamine with ondansetron, and our transdermal scopolamine is long-acting, so it typically lasts about two or three days, so it's good to put it up front before surgery. And ondansetron being short-acting, we recommend that you give it at the end of the surgical procedure rather at the beginning. And with this combination, you can see that it works better than the single agent of undansetron alone. The type of fluids that you give patients, especially in the larger cases such as colorectal surgery, some of the major uh, blood loss surgery, can have an important bearing in the incidence of nausea and vomiting. Several years ago, we did a study comparing using both colloid and crystalloid, and thereby reducing the amount of crystalloid use versus predominantly crystalloid. And on average, we were getting about five to six liters in this uh, uh, crystalloid group. And again, you can see that incidence of nausea and vomiting was higher with the predominant use of crystalloid, in particular in patients who are having, uh, receiving fair amount of fluid intraoperative period. Some of the misconception on post-operative nausea and vomiting, and one of them, sometimes my residents say that I put in a nasogastric tube, I suck it all out, the stomach is empty, the patient is not going to get sick. <coughs> Unfortunately, it's not quite simple. It uh, doesn't mean that it is, I think it's a good practice to empty the stomach to prevent aspiration, but as this study shows, whether you have nasogastric tube or not, it does not affect the incidence of post-operative nausea and vomiting. Another common misconception, metaclopamide, very commonly used. It is a good drug to empty the stomach. It's a prokinetics. I'd use it in obese patient, diabetic patient, but it's not a very effective antiemetics. If you look at the number needed to treat numbers, typically it's about one in 10, one in 12. In other words, you need to treat 10 to 12 patients before one patient get benefit. As you can see here, meta-analysis comparing metaclopamide either versus ondansetron or versus droperidol, they all favor either ondansetron or droperidol, at least at the 10 milligram metaclopamide levels. So the question is that what should I use? Is a drug, one drug better than the other drugs? Well, there have been many studies that have been done, and this is one of the fairly large studies of 4,000 patients. And essentially, the answer is that it doesn't matter which drug you use. Most of the drugs have efficacy to reduce nausea and vomiting. So this study shows that whether you use ondansetron, dexamethasone, droperidol, or propofol, you reduce the risk by between about 20 to 
And that means that uh, if you are, have a patient, for example, that have a baseline risk of, let's say, 50% based on the risk factors. If you use one drug, and it doesn't matter which one you use from what I showed you in a previous slide, you reduce that risk by about 25%. Now you say that, well, you know, 25% is not what I'm aiming for. I want to be better. So what do you do then? You add a second drug, because by adding the second drug, you reduce that risk by a further 25%. And having a third drug on board, you again correspondingly reduce the risk. So it seems to be additive. Two or three drugs would be the optimal combination to avoid uh, trying to reduce the risk. What about someone who come to you and said, every single time I have anesthetic, I have four or five anesthetic, I always develop nausea and vomiting. Can you do something different? I'm sure you have those patients that comes to you. So this is a study that we did in high-risk patients. What we found is that if you combine two antiemetics together with propofol anesthetic, TIVA with propofol, you have the best chance of success in not seeing nausea and vomiting complete response. Much better than using inhalation agent and combination or just using propofol alone. So high-risk patient, couple of combination antiemetics with propofol as the maintenance of anesthesia techniques. Now, I have mentioned to you that your US healthcare system is changing, and this is uh, um, maybe the health, new healthcare system that we are welcoming. And the nurse went up to the patient and said, I'm sorry, sir, but the new healthcare program doesn't provide for animals. So I guess uh, this could be a potential colorectal patient. So I'm going to have to, uh, I guess I'll let you read the rest of the caption. So the question is this. Is it better to wait and see, let the patient throw up, and then treat them, or should we prophylax the patient? And that is a fundamental question. And I think that depends on the risk of the patients. Because we know that once nausea and vomiting occurs, they typically stay in the PACU longer by about half an hour to an hour, on average, some even longer. As our data shows here, the moment they throw up, the moment they complain of nausea, their length of PACU stay automatically increases. So if your PACU is your bottleneck to try to receive patients from the operating room, then that would have significant impact in terms of the economics of it. You can't get a patient to the floor and you can't get a patient from the OR, and there's a bottleneck, and your surgeon will be screaming at you and say, why can't I get the next case started? Because the PACU is full. So that may have implications. So I'm going to finish off to give you a little practical guide. How do I manage nausea and vomiting in the surgical patient? I think, first of all, it's important to assess the risk. Because that gives you an opportun uh, opportunity to talk to your patients to see what they are concerned about. Because some patients really don't want to be sick, regardless. They will tell you that, just give me anything, I don't want to be sick. But if they are low risk, potentially you can say, well, you know, you have no risk factors, you can do a wait and see. Moderate or high risk patient, you may want to think about, maybe I can avoid inhalation or anesthetic by doing a regional technique. But sometimes you can't. Then I think even then you can do something about it. There are things that you can do. You can do a, a, a non-pharmacological technique, as well as what I call reducing the baseline risk. So what are they? Avoid opioids if you can help it. Again, I'm not saying don't use opioid, but using some of the opioid adjuncts that we talked about yesterday afternoon session. Avoid nitrous. It does increase it slightly, I would say. High dose reversal agent neostigmine has been implicated especially above five milligrams to increase the risk for PONV. Adequate hydration, simple to do, inexpensive. Propofol anesthetic is probably one of the single most important factor you can do to your patients in those high-risk patients. Beyond that, give a prophylactic antiemetics. Consider, perhaps in high-risk patients, more than one prophylactic antiemetics. Two or three will be the optimal, and in high-risk patients, propofol anesthetics. And I can see here is a portfolio of uh, some of the choices that you can use. So we talk about some of these. Again, pick two or three agents, and in very high-risk patient, propofol anti-emetics. Um, the uh, 
I, I don't know whether the video would work. I remember that uh, I tell you about this uh, person who stood up at the end of my uh, talk. And uh, you know, at the end of my talk, he thought, well, maybe I should go and see my patient um, you know, following, following surgery. And uh, so I was going to show you the video. This is where he went up to see the patient post-operatively, and this is what he got. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>